G'day everyone, this is Jackson Millar, the Wealth Mentor. And my name is Sam Panetta, and I am back for this Sam's week's episode. Back. Sam is back. I'm back. I Mate, feel, it's uh, good to have you back. I feel like a wrestler. You know, like when a wrestler makes a big comeback, so you're, you've made your, uh, your debut again. Correct. So, uh, mate, it's uh, it's been uh, a uh, interesting journey. We went from uh, killing it on our Ask or Is Anything, and then you went into the abyss. Yeah. And I had to do it by myself. Yeah. I winged it in normal yeah. fashion. I had uh, my notes, not a pretty spreadsheet like yours. <laughs> I uh, I had a, I had a pink post-it note. <laughs> what did you write on it? I wrote a couple of things. Did you watch? I think you were watching. How did I it watched go? a couple of times. It was oh, good. Mate, I it enjoyed good. it. Yeah, I it liked good. it. Yeah. And then I got Sal and we had Gary. Gary came on board. That was all good fun. So now we're back, mate. It's we good, are good back. to have you back. 28 episodes. 28 episodes. How many of them you reckon I missed? You've missed a lot of them. Uh, I reckon. I haven't missed one, have I? Yeah, you have, mate. I missed one when I was in. I was in. Uh, you in the Philippines. Philippines. You in the Philippines. I think I done it with Sal. Then that was good. Um, that was a good episode, but I don't reckon I've missed eight. I reckon I've missed. No, I reckon I've missed fifteen percent. I reckon <laughs> I've, I've missed somewhere between That's three right. and five episodes I don't of, of Ask or Is Anything. Well, for those of you who uh, are joining us for the first time, Ask or Is Anything is our weekly live Q and A where we answer your questions about finance, business, lifestyle, beards, anything in between. So uh, we're here to deliver a lot of value. We're trying to shift up the format a little bit to have uh, a little bit more uh, dialogue, uh, trying to go into the subjects in a little bit more detail instead of just kind of skimming over the surface and uh, hopefully starting a conversation with you guys uh, who are watching live. So, uh, so yeah, uh, for those of you who uh, want to ask a question, we do prioritise your questions. Otherwise, we have some, uh, some topics and questions that have come through uh, over the past uh, week or so uh, that we will cover uh, if there aren't any questions live. Yeah, that's right. And look, if, if you guys are sitting there watching and you've got questions, make sure that you ask them. Uh, if you don't have questions or, or you're too shy, uh, show us some love anyway. Hit like, write g'day, uh, share the post. I'm sure that uh, your family and friends uh, have some sort of questions. The majority of people uh, sort of need help around all this sort of this money jargon. So that's what Jackson and I sit here for uh, for an hour and that's what we talk about. So, you know, feel free to, uh, to to get social. That's the whole point of social media. Yeah. But um, that's it. So we've got the, the Wealth Mentor community, mate. What What's happening there? Yes, yeah, so it's growing still uh, steadily. We've got a community uh, where essentially we share regular tips, tricks, and insights and uh, try and add a lot of value with like-minded people who are wanting to work towards financial freedom. So for those of you who aren't uh, uh, members of the community yet, please make sure you do jump on board. As a bit of a value add at the moment, we are giving a copy of my international best-selling book away for free to anyone who joins. And we've also just uh, enhanced the accountability program that supports that book. So what we found is that most people, whenever they get a book, uh, whether it be a digital book or a hard copy, uh, it sits on the shelf. Uh, I know that that's what happens with me. I, uh, I've, uh, I, and ultimately I forget about it. So we've actually created an email campaign that supports every single chapter of the book to give you a swift old kick up the behind, uh, whenever you may have fallen off the wagon. So, uh, we're getting some really good feedback on that at the moment, which is fantastic. Look, and the whole point of that guys, right. It's to hold you accountable. A lot of people do this. So they, they look at something and they go, all right, I need to make a change or I need to learn something. So they go away. Uh, they, they buy a book on the particular subject they want to learn about, or they want to improve in their life. Uh, they go away, they read the book, they get really motivated and they get really excited because they've learned some things, heaps of uh, endorphins and all that jazz, and then they do bugger all with the information. <laughs> so they take no action, they feel good for six months, and then they get sad again, they buy another book, or they go to a Tony Robbins seminar, and he screams at them. And makes them walk on fire. Makes them walk on fire. I wouldn't do that shit, but it, that's what happens, and then they get excited again, and then they don't do anything. So the whole reason uh, Jackson spent a lot of time putting together this, this accountability campaign is to make sure that... For those of you who are reading the book, uh, to guide you through the book and then to make sure that you're actually going away and implementing uh, the advice and the hints and the tips that are in the book yeah. to actually make real progress and real improvements uh, to your financial lives. So jump onto that and uh, make sure you're part of the community to be able to get uh, the most value and we will help hold you accountable to doing what you're supposed to do. Um, 
Thanks for everyone who's joining us so far. G'day, Mr. Matt Bailey. I hope, I'm not sure if you're still in, in Cairns or uh, wherever you, uh, you may be at the moment. Sam's breaking my laptop. Um, Sam, don't touch. All right, mate. All right, just take hands off. Um, but in any case, uh, thanks for, uh, for joining us. Now, a bit of our legal jargon, Sam. Yeah, so this is uh, it's a, a general advice warning, we call it. So everything that we talk about uh, here tonight and on all the episodes of Ask Or If Anything is general advice only. Uh, do not go away and action anything that we talk about without talking to a professional first and getting uh, tailored specific advice for your situation. And uh, that'll... That'll keep Jackson and I out of uh, trouble and out of the uh, Royal Commission. <laughs> so, so that'd, be, that'd be great. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, so let's dive right in. Sam, you can have question number one. All right, so this is something that I get all the time. So a lot of our clients are business owners and they're trying to get ahead and they always ask me, is it hard to get a home loan as a business owner? And the reason this is so common, this question, is because it's so important for so many people. They uh, get into business, they sacrifice um, you know, their personal goals to grow their business and achieve their business goals. And then it takes them two or three years to get the business cranking. And then they, they start making money again. Uh, and then they want to buy a home or they want to buy an investment property or something like that. And then they get to, they've saved up a, a deposit, they get to the banks and the banks just won't lend them any money. So is it hard to get a home loan as a business owner? Uh, not inherently. All right, so while it's a little bit more complicated and you need to be a little bit more uh, clever about how you go about it, it's not hard to get a home loan just because uh, you're a business owner. If you're a business owner and you've got everything structured correctly and you're doing really well in business, it's actually easier uh, to get a home loan as a business owner because you've got more variables uh, to, to change and, and to adjust. The reason people think it's harder to get a home loan as a business owner is because people are taught that as a business owner, you should minimize your tax. So what does your accountant do? At the end of the year, uh, you take your, your tax returns and all your financials to your accountant. They bump up all your expenses. They reduce your income. Uh, and it looks like you've made bugger all money. You pay hardly any tax. So you're very happy about that. And then you go to get a million dollar home loan to, to buy your house. And the bank says, mate, you made 15 grand this year. You made 10 grand last year. You haven't paid any tax, but you haven't made any money. So we're not going to give you a home loan. So that's why people think it's hard. If you plan, if you plan 12 months ahead, um, then it's, it's doable. It's very doable. I've got clients, uh, long-term clients of ours who are planning every 12 months ahead as business owners. They know the amount of revenue they need to make. They know the amount of profits they need to make. And they've actually been able to accumulate one or two investment properties every single year and continue to borrow more and, and create more wealth because they've got a plan. And these are business owners. So they've gone from no properties to three or four properties in a couple of years, which is a really good result. Yeah, I think this is really important. And um, before we dive in, uh, Danny Pastro, I'd love to see Sam walk on fire as well. <laughs> that, uh, that would be phenomenal. Uh, phenomenal. I'd pay good money for that. And uh, g'day, Ken. Thanks for joining us. G'day, Ken, Daniel, well, look, Maddie. I, I think as a business owner, it's all a matter of perspective, right? Yeah. Um, like, it's one of these things. If, if you don't have a plan, then you're essentially planning to fail, right? Fail to plan, plan to fail. Um, age old saying. And most business owners only have their accountant as an advisor. And what you need to understand is that your accountant's number one value add to you is minimizing your tax. An accountant's scope of advice is very, very small. And I think a lot of people always have gone to their accountant as the go-to, the, the so-called business advisor. But really, all your accountant is going to do for you is manage your tax and your compliance with the ATO. So you need to be mindful of who, is, who you're paying for advice and, and what is in their, their, their capacity to be able to provide to you. So what we find is that clients come to us as small business owners, want to buy a property, and their financials may not be in a position, like Sam said, to be able to support them uh, to be able to do so. So it's about setting up the right plan of saying, okay, well, this is your current situation. This is how much you could borrow today. And then essentially, if you want to buy this property at this level, this is how much profit you need to show, how much salary or income you need to pay to yourself or to your, your partner, and essentially uh, set up a structure for us to get there. Now, this really starts with a couple of key things. The first one is setting a budget in your business. Um, as Sam said, uh, you can be the small business owner where you're, you're paying through the teeth in terms of your, your expenses just to minimise tax. But from a, a, a good business standpoint, there is only a certain amount that you should be spending in your expenses. 
uh, if you were, uh, I guess, a high value business. Most of the biggest organizations in the world have a very, very efficient with their costs because they're trying to actually show as much profit as they can to keep shareholders happy. So you gotta understand that uh, you are your own shareholder in your business, and it might be you and your partner. So therefore you should be amplifying profits so you can keep yourself happy as a shareholder and allow yourself to continue to build wealth personally. It's just a different frame of mind, isn't it? It is a different frame of mind. And, and eight or nine out of every 10 people, they've probably got this wrong. Do you know what I mean? And, and we, a lot of people come to us and they say they wanna save tax, they wanna save tax. And you know, they do that for 10 years. And you say to them, well, 10 years ago, if you would have bought a property or two properties and they would have all doubled in value, you would have made, I don't know, a million dollars or something in profit if mm. you're buying property in Sydney. Um, if you were saving tax, you're not going to save a million dollars worth of tax over the past 10 years. You might save 10 grand here, five grand there, even, even 20 grand here and there, but it's you're not going to save as much in tax as what you're going to make in capital growth and cash flow from being able uh, to invest in growth assets. So a bit of a, bit of a, a mind change for most people. Yeah, so let's kind of give some takeaways. For most of the, the people that, that kind of follow us, uh, are professionals, business owners. Um, so for business owners, I guess, what are some kind of key takeaways um, that they should be considering in terms of shifting their mindset in their business? I think the most important thing is that you need to think of yourself as the shareholder in the business and you need to work out what makes your business worth as much as possible and then push your business as though it had outside investors that were wanting to see the business grow and thrive. Uh, I think having this mentality of, of you know, the, the one man band or the very small business mm -hmm. owner uh, who's doing it just as a, as a private entity, it keeps you thinking small. So think big would be my takeaway. Yep. And I think it's about having a strategy. Um, if, if you don't have uh, something that you're working towards, you will always run your business the way that you always have. Um, most people get into business with these grand ideas of what they're trying to create and then just eventually life kind of eats away at them and they just accept the status quo. So uh, it's about kind of getting excited again about what you're trying to achieve and then essentially creating a strategy that you can continue to push the pace. And that might not necessarily mean that you have to, to, to build a, a, an immensely profitable business. Uh, it may be just trying to get your, your time back to spend more time doing what you enjoy. So it's just all about kind of linking that back to, uh, to, to what you want to achieve in life and then just having the right plan to support yourself uh, in, in making that happen. Agreed. Awesome. So anyone who's watching, if you have any, any questions or any comments, if you would like to see Sal uh, walk on fire, I'm not going to do it. Just, you know. Sal uh, would love to walk on fire. Speak up. You have to speak up. Nonna's here. Lena Panetta. Hello, Nonna. Good day, Nonna. Hello. All right. So we're going to dive into the next question. This is a question that I actually got asked uh, from a, uh, a, it's kind of a Q&A website for advisors um, called Advisor Ratings. Um, so uh, there's an individual who sent through a question and I'm actually in the process of writing the answer for that, but I figured I'd share it with uh, all of you first. Um, so hopefully uh, you, you feel honoured. Um, so the question was, if my father gifts money to myself and my brother to help us get on the property ladder, uh, will this affect his Centrelink uh, payments? Um, and uh, there's a few important things here uh, that particularly for the older generation, we, we're starting to see more and more that they're wanting to help the, the, the younger generation get a, a foot on the, on the property ladder. We've obviously seen there's been crazy growth that's happened in, in the property market. Uh, and uh, of course, this is, uh, is having a flow on effect uh, to, to people just being able to save enough to catch up. Although we're starting to see the property market cool, uh, we, we, it is still a, a huge uh, jump to be able to get uh, into a, a decent sized property, particularly on, in, in Sydney, on the Northern beaches, inner west, eastern suburbs, it's tough. So we're seeing that there's a lot of, uh, of, of, of the older generation who are wanting to kind of gift some money, uh, but they are conscious of what the implications may be. So when it comes to Centrelink, uh, if your father is, uh, is currently entitled to Centrelink and the money is essentially sitting there in the bank, the Centrelink, uh, Centrelink has already considered it uh, for the assets and income test. They have looked at the, the capital value and they've assessed that against the, uh, the, the assets test. And also they've likely deemed a certain level of income, uh, which is all taken into consideration. Now, what that means is that uh, if that's the case and the money's been sitting in the bank and already been assessed, there's not going to be any adverse implications with him giving you a gift or yourself and your brother for that matter. 
um, but it's also not going to provide any benefits in terms of uh, the uh, of receiving more Centrelink because he's got rid of assets. The thing is that Centrelink are, are pretty cluey. They don't want to pay uh, the older generation, uh, the retirees, any more money than they need to. So they put a cap on the amount of money that you can gift away, and it's essentially 10,000 in one year, or you can give up to 30,000 over five years. So it's substantially less than this sum of money that we're talking about. Uh, I think the client was looking to, to get about 250,000, which is a, a great gift, a really good head start. Um, so first things first is, if you're in doubt, ask Centrelink. Uh, Centrelink, typically, if you call during the day, you'd be on hold for about 45 minutes. If you call first thing in the morning around 8 o'clock or 8.30, you can get through very quickly. Speak to the Centrelink assessor and get their opinion to say, hey, look, this is what we're looking to do. Uh, can you advise on what the impact would be for assets and income test purposes? They're not out to burn you. Uh, they will give you the insights before, uh, before the fact and help you kind of make an informed decision around what the potential pros and cons may be. Um, so hopefully that gives you some insights. Um, Centrelink is very complex, so it pays to get advice. Um, so just make sure that you, uh, that you either reach out to Centrelink yourself uh, or uh, get in touch with us. We've got Centrelink calculators and things like this we can give you access to if, if it's something that you want to be mindful of. Yeah, and I think this flows into a lot of other things, mate. So I had, I had this conversation uh, with, with a client of ours the other day. Uh, they're approaching retirement, right? Uh, they essentially want to accumulate more wealth prior to retirement. They've, they've They've done a similar thing to this yep. guy. They've helped their kids out. And it, there comes a point, right, and this is going to seem so contradictory because uh, in the last question, we said, don't worry about the tax, right? But now I'm about to say, do worry about the tax. 100%. So it's about being smart with your tax. And as you approach retirement, uh, you do get more opportunities uh, to reduce your to optimize the optimize tax. yeah you get more opportunities to optimize your tax however it's really complex and i guarantee you are not going to be able to do it on your own um and it's one of these things that if you get it wrong it can have uh massive financial implications for, for years for decades but if you get it right and you you understand it or you speak to someone who understands it uh then for very little uh effort you're going to get very good results you know if you if you're saving 10 20 or 30 percent mm. uh, on your tax there's no investment that's going to go up consistently that much 100%. every year so it's more about structuring yourself correctly um then you, you know what it yeah. is then then taking big it's a life right? stage thing so mm. as you're accumulating wealth uh, you want to try and get in a position where you're paying as much tax as possible because essentially a consequence is, is because you're paying all that tax, it means you're making a lot of money. And it's about making sure that you get that, that, that money that, you've, that you're earning into investments that will continue to compound over time. Now, as you start approaching retirement, it's about changing your strategy. You want to start optimizing your strategy to get in a position where you're paying the least amount of tax as possible. Because what that means is that we're now in, an, in a stage where we want passive income. So of course, we want to have as many dollars in our bank account and as few dollars in the ATO's bank account as we possibly can. I'll give you an example. We got a referral recently from an older couple who had basically full age pension, no assets really outside of their home, but they had a very substantial value home. And essentially, uh, they, they didn't need the, the, that size of home uh, anymore. Of course, the kids are, are uh, much older, had flown the coop uh, many decades ago, and they were considering a downsize. Now, under Centrelink's current rules, the home is exempt for assets test purposes, meaning that it doesn't matter how big your home is, it could be a $10 million home. If you've got no other assets outside of your home, then essentially you're not uh, implicated uh, as a result of your, your Centrelink entitlements. Now, if you do downsize, however, if there is an additional amount that's excess after you've acquired a new home, that is now accessible. And in this circumstance, it actually meant that they were going to lose all of their age pension. But what I explained to them was that if we structured it in a certain way and put it into an investment, even though a really low risk investment, they're actually going to have more income than what Centrelink was providing them, meaning they're gonna have a better lifestyle. So it's about understanding the situation, doing the hard numbers, and then being able to make an informed decision off the back of it. That's just what it's all about. And that's the thing, mate. Like most people don't know what the, the end goal is or they don't know what they're trying to achieve. And it's very hard to make good financial decisions when you don't know what your end goal is because any road can sort of lead you there because yeah. it, you've got no destination. And you have to think, the, these particular clients that, that you used as an example, in the, you know, they're trying to save on tax and they're trying to get the Centrelink benefits. I think at 80 years of age, you're in your 80s, 
right? Aren't you better off just doing whatever provides you the best lifestyle Correct. for, for your, the, the years you have left? Correct. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's not really about accumulating wealth anymore. It's about reaping uh, what you've sowed over the past 50, 60, 70, 80 years of your life. Um, and uh, it's a little bit off track, but it, it, it's a means to an end. Do you know yeah, what I mean? 100%. It's important to think about it. And look, most of you, I'm, I'm sure the, uh, the, the 80 year old clients are probably not watching at the moment. No, uh, but your they're, parents, they're asleep. Yeah, they're asleep. Well, they're, they're watching uh, Burgo's catchphrase or something. <laughs> <laughs> but um, your parents may be those, uh, th those individuals and they're going to need your guidance when it comes to getting the right advice. Um, so just be mindful of that. Uh, All right, so, so what, what have we got here? Great eating? question here from Ken. Now, Ken, you said, uh, what are your views on the property market, gents? Uh, there are rumours of prices slowing. Do you see them dropping and becoming more affordable? Get the crystal ball out. I love out. you, Ken. I love uh, you. You're such a good man. Uh, All right. Do you want me to get my crystal ball out? You get your crystal ball out, mate. All right. So, in my opinion, markets trend, right? I don't, I don't care what sort of market it is. They, they have periods when they, they trend up, they have periods where they trend down, and they have periods where they trend sideways. And more often than not, uh, a market will continue to trend in whatever direction it's already going uh, until something um, changes it. So what we're seeing at the moment, we're seeing Sydney slow down um, a little bit, we're seeing Melbourne slow down slightly, right? Melbourne's still really strong because it has uh, lots of affordability still uh, and heaps of, of immigration, heaps of population growth. Uh, Sydney was totally unaffordable um, and, you know, the interest rates and the, the, uh, the lending barriers have, have made it harder for people to borrow. Uh, Brisbane is struggling because there's just too much uh, property going on getting developed there. Perth has sort of plateaued at a very at a very low base. Um, Hobart's uh, actually doing great. It's still going up every single month. Uh, Adelaide's, uh, who, who knows what Adelaide does? It's been doing the same thing since 1972. Uh, and up in uh, Darwin, that's sort of uh, struggling a little bit as well, but it's sort of found its, its footing. So that's where we're at with the markets. And moving forward, I would expect that we're still going to see plateauing and, and weakness in Sydney. Um, it's just that all the recipes are there. there. There's no reason for Sydney to crash. Like these things that Sydney's going to half in price, Sydney's not going to half in price. I, I tell you now, it'll, it'll come off. It'll still continue to come off and it'll plateau. Um, some people will get bargains as people need to sell, uh, but it, it, it'll hold its own. And then in, in 10 years, we're going to be talking about this. And mark my words, we're going to be talking about the average unit price being over a million bucks. Mark 100%. my words, in 10 years' time. Um, Melbourne, I think Melbourne's going to continue to do well. Uh, I don't know if it's going to do as, as well as it has over the past few years. I think if it does come off, it'll come off only a little bit. Uh, I think Brisbane, um, I, I think Brisbane is really going to struggle some more. There's just too much property on the market in, in Brisbane and there's, there's more coming. Uh, Hobart uh, is essentially going to, I don't know, keep doing well, I guess, mm. until, until something changes there. Perth um, is probably the market I'm the, the most keenest to watch because it's at a very low base, uh, it's super affordable, it's been coming off for years, it's sort of um, stopped going down now uh, and it, I expect it will, I expect it will uh, turn one day when it goes, I think it's going to go. Yeah. Um, Adelaide, Adelaide doesn't have the population to growth. Push it, mate. There's nothing to push Adelaide. No, there's only so many bottles of Penfolds you can sell. Right? Correct, correct. And then um, Darwin's uh, the same. So it just doesn't have any push uh, to, to make it go. Um, and then you've got all your regional markets across Australia. Yeah. Um, they're mostly driven by local uh, economics. Some will do well over time. Some uh, won't do well over time. Yeah. The... I guess that's, that's as holistic as I can yeah. put it, mate. Look, here's the thing, Ken. I'll simplify it uh, for you. This is all about the fundamentals that drive things to grow in, in, in any investment or any asset. There is supply and there's demand and there's affordability or some, what somebody is prepared to pay for something. Now, what we found is that particularly in, in Sydney, uh, affordability was strained. It was getting harder to get money from the banks because uh, the banks are tightening the belt. Uh, the property prices have just got to unattainable levels for most. And essentially, the, the demand has fell out of the market. There are not as many people in the market looking to buy property than there was 12 months ago. Um, and that's because I guess a lot of people had that fear of missing out as well. They were just stretching themselves to try and get a foot in the, on the ladder uh, or buy that, that dream home and essentially thinking that property was just going to continue to go the same way it was. 
So ultimately, um, because of that, we've got to a point now where there is less demand, so therefore, uh, there is there's not, not as much pressure to push up prices. At a basic level, even at a, at a micro level, at a suburb by suburb level, there is always gonna be suburbs that are higher, more highly demanded than others. To give you an example, um, the, recently on the Northern Beaches, um, there was a, a, a property, a, a house that was being sold uh, on around the Wheeler Heights area for a million bucks. And they were pretty much trying to just give it away. That was unheard of for years. Unheard of for years. years. And then there's units in Collaroy that are selling for upwards of 2.4 to $2.8 million. And they continue to push up the price month by month. So it all comes down to who is there on the day and what they're prepared to pay for it. And also, do they have the, the, the financial backing to allow them to, to get the money from the bank? And that's what it comes down to. So if you understand the fundamentals uh, and you're able to sit on your hands and look objectively, you're always going to be able to find good deals and you just need to be able to be in the market for long enough. I'm sure, as Sam said, if you buy a property today that you can afford and you can afford to hold on to it, in ten, and it's in a desirable area where the fundamentals stack up, in 10 years' time, it's going to be worth more than what it is right now. 100%. It's just, it's, it's a growth asset. It's in a good area. They're not, particularly if it's already built out, like the Northern Beaches is a prime example. If you own a house on the Northern Beaches, it's going to do well over the next 10 years. Just Let's just face it. Um, so uh, it's just a matter of just making sure you've got the, the money, you can afford to hold on to it and just let the market do the rest. Yeah, look, I, I've got a, a simple way of looking at it, Ken. Um, with property, I feel that I should accumulate as much property as I can, as I can afford it. Um, you know, if you can pick the right markets that are moving at the right time, even better. Um, but it's, it's one of those things that some people, when the market's going up, they go, I'm not buying now, the market's going up. And sometimes like now when the market's going down, people go, I'm, I'm not, not buying, buying now, the market's going down. And they just don't buy anything. And which is even worse. You know, you could have, over the past 50 years, you could have bought the worst property in the worst street at the worst time in the market, property every 10 years for the past 50, and guess what? Today you're a multimillionaire. So it's, it just goes to show time in the market. All right, so we've got a few things here. Um, Lauren Pastro, welcome back, Sam, twice, which is really good. Uh, thanks, Lauren. It is uh, good to be back. Um, I feel alive. It's good, I'm glad. It's it's good to I be can't back. Can't lose you yet, Sam. No, not not yet. We we insured against it anyway. Exactly. But let's hope we're going to talk about that later. Doesn't come to that. Um, Ken Pickett, I just answered his question, and he still wants me to walk on fire. Come on, mate. Ken, if you come and you walk on fire, well, Jackson and I'll take you out for dinner. If you come to <laughs> you the Orient, if you survive, and we we'll film it. We'll film it for our social media. Let's get and, the insurance in place first. And then we'll take you out for a couple of beers, Ken. We'll warm your, cool your feet down. Um, Aureus Financial says, first class, round the world trip uh, at age 80. I bet you that was that was Sal because it wasn't me. You, uh, Darren says, hi, Sam. Nice look. Thank you, Darren. I'm yeah, not sure in. if uh, you mean my, my shaved head, my thickening beard, or my sloppy joe, but I will take... Enough. Any of those, <laughs> either of them, as a, as a as a compliment. Um, Ken Pickett, it would be great if it did half in price. Beachfront, here I can. Ken, if Sydney halved in price, we'd all be out of a job. I tell we you, have there to would worry be some about, catastrophic mate. economic events uh, for for uh, for Sydney prices. Don't, don't sit on your cash waiting for that. Darian, Sydney will half in price if I'm PM. Darian, for PM. You, you're worrying me, uh, Darian. Darian, you're worrying me, mate. Uh, uh, da, da, da. hike max LVR to 50%. Uh, I, I probably wouldn't do that. I'd be out of a job if that happened. Um, I wouldn't be hiking max LVR to 50%. Adelaide has churches. Adelaide does have churches, Darian. It's, um, I don't know if that's, a, it that, does that's have helping a lot, the property It does market. have a lot of churches and they're actually quite nice. I don't know if it makes the price of property go up, but it does have a lot of nice churches. And Kenny's back. I'm a broker. I'll bring my own liability. Ah, he is. He's an insurance broker. Yeah, okay. He is. Big Ken. Good on you, Ken. Well, look, as long as you're insured, mate, you can walk on the fire, all right? <laughs> That's all right. I just don't want to see you get hurt. No. All right, thanks, guys. So for anyone who's sitting there watching, if you have any questions, some questions, throw them at us. Throw them at us, guys. Let's, let's keep the banter all right. going. All right. So this is something I get a lot uh, these days is a lot more people are becoming involved with business. Have you noticed that? Yeah, I'm getting, there's a big spike in it. And um, a lot of it is, uh, I guess, hospitality and cafe related. 
Um, so uh, it's, it's interesting. Um, it's interesting to, to see. I think this comes down to, to uh, investor sentiment. Mm. People have a positive outlook. Mm. Although property prices are high, property prices are, is a lag indicator for economic prosperity, right? Mm. Um, so it's interesting. But let's go through the question. Yeah, so the question is, is it possible to get a loan from the bank to buy an established coffee shop? Uh, in short, yes. The answer is yes. Um, if you are the right client and that's the right business, then the banks uh, will lend you money. You have your top tier banks like your, your ANZs and things like that. And then you've got your second tier lenders and then you've got your third tiers and your private funders. Um, essentially, the further out on the curve you go, uh, the higher the interest rate is going to be, uh, the worse the terms of the loan are going to be. Um, you know, the more in favour to the lender, the less in favour to the borrower. Uh, but essentially, somewhere along that line, as long as it makes sense, uh, yes, you will be able to, to fund the acquisition of a coffee shop, uh, especially if it's established. Now, a, a few caveats to that. They, they want to know that you know how to run a coffee shop. Do you know what I mean? They want to see that you've got some experience or you've got some collateral. If um, Let's say that, that Joe Bloggs, off the side of the road, uh, came in, walked into a bank and said, I've never worked in a cafe, I've got no savings, I've got no property, um, I've got a credit defaults and I want to borrow half a million dollars uh, to buy the local coffee shop, the, uh, the answer is going to be no. Right? Uh, on the flip side, if you had someone who walked into a bank and they said, hey, um, I'm, I'm um, Jared Bloggs, and Jared Bloggs said, um, uh, my name's Jared Bloggs, I save 10 grand a month, I have five uh, properties, I've been running cafes for 20 years, uh, and I want to buy this $500,000 coffee shop and I've got 250 grand to contribute towards it, uh, then all the banks are going to be throwing uh, money at that particular customer. So, um, it, look, it really comes down to the individual in the business, but... I'm excited by these this people investing in businesses, yeah. you know? Look, I think the, the key thing is most people get this idea one day and then decide that they're going to just go out and try and get funding and they'll fail. Um, it all comes down to having the right strategy, uh, having the ability to know that you it, it's a viable business because the, the reason why I guess there are a lot of cafes and, and hospitality businesses for sale is that historically there's a very low barrier to entry uh, people start these things with no or little business acumen, very little or no business strategy, and they fall short of their ambitions. Mm. And ultimately, these, these go onto the market and they sell. Uh, so you need to be mindful that, firstly, you're looking at it objectively, that it is a good business opportunity. Um, I'm actually helping a client with one at the moment. Uh, it's a business that's well-established, really good profit, uh, good infrastructure and support networks, um, low overheads. It's, it's a great business. And essentially, it's, it's, it looks like it's, it's a good opportunity. So it's just a matter of going through the due diligence and then looking to try and get uh, the, the, the money from a lender. Um, you, you, if you walked into your St. George or your NAB branch, they're probably not going to lend you for these types of, of things, are they? Look, unless you've got uh, equity in a property. Unless you're a premium client, so your top tier lenders, like your big four and things like that, uh, they are only going to lend to your premium, premium clients. And then your second tier lenders will go a little bit further out. Then you get into your third tiers and your specialists. But what's happening at the moment, this is a big change. And there's a whole industry that exists today that didn't exist five years ago, which is all these small lenders, these small funders. And they're, they're expensive, right? But they're helping business owners get into businesses and grow their businesses. They're pooling money together from private investors uh, and they're essentially lending that money out at commercial rates uh, for people to get involved in businesses like this. And they're a lot more lenient mm. than what the, the majors are. And as long as something makes sense um, and they think that the business will succeed and the business person will succeed, yeah. then they'll, they'll fund you. They'll fund the, the, fund the growth. Yeah. So it's either the track history of the business, your track history as an entrepreneur or a business owner, or your asset position that essentially de-risks uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the lender. Uh, so essentially ensuring that they can recoup their money. So it's always good to get the right advice once again. Um, it's about understanding the, the due diligence process. And typically when you go to, to, to buy a business, you need to have your funding options uh, lined up. You need to have the right strategy in place in terms of understanding the legal agreements, your structures, uh, and all of these types of things. And you essentially need to make sure that the numbers stack up as well. Um, so if you've got these three aspects, which typically involve uh, a broker, 
a, a, a lawyer, an accountant, and a business advisor or a financial advisor uh, who understands uh, business acquisition. Um, and once you got that, those things sorted, you're pretty much set um, and uh, you've, uh, you're able to get started the right way. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Good way to put it. Peter oh, Curie. Oh, our good friend Peter Curie is here. Hello, oh, Peter. We've, we've, we've missed you, Peter Curie. Has he been on these past he couple of weeks? He hasn't liked me. He only likes you. Come on, mate. I thought you were, I thought you were our, our b- b- biggest supporter. He just sends me memes uh, via private message. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Peter Curie. Oh, g'day, guys. So, look, anyone else who's, who's uh, watching, if you have any questions, or you've got, any, got anything to say, you got any funny memes, uh, send them through. Please we do. love a love a bit of banter. We should call this uh, Send Aureus Memes. That's the new segment. That's the new hashtag. All right. So, uh, this is a great question. I had a client that came in the other day, and uh, it was a good one, just to understand the, the thought process that, that went into this. And I think there's a common misconception around this subject, and there's going to be a value to, to many of uh, you professionals. So the question was, if I get a car allowance from work and the running costs of the car that I have are less than my employer is giving me for my car allowance, should I buy another car? Um, so essentially meaning that you, 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 your employer provides you, let's say, $20,000 a year to, to, as a car allowance. Your running costs are only $10,000. Um, what do you do with the other ten? So ultimately, whenever it comes to financing anything, uh, whether it be a vehicle, whether it be uh, a property, whether it be anything. Um, does it make sense? Are you going to buy that in any case? Does it make sense as a standalone before you get finance into the mix? So if you already have a car and you don't need a second car, then don't buy one. Um, because it's always going to work out more expensive for you because it's an added cost that you just didn't need. Now, what you need to be mindful of is that a car allowance, although it is uh, itemised separately on your pay slip and on your group certificate, um, it is very much taxed the same. Uh, And essentially what's happening is that you've got this car allowance, which is basically just a fringe benefit from your employer. Your employer actually may be paying extra tax as a result, but really no implications for you. Um, You've gone and got a car, so they don't have to have uh, the vehicle or the debt on their own balance sheet. So it's one less risk for them. Uh, And essentially you are essentially responsible for managing all of that. if you essentially can run your, your vehicle uh, for less than what your employer is giving you, then power to you. You've got an extra 10 grand in that scenario that I just gave that you can use for, for your own wealth creation or something else. However, if you're in a situation where you, you do need a second vehicle, uh, then of course, consider how you're going to do it. Um, could you just utilize that extra $10,000 to save up to buy another vehicle uh, than having to set up a separate lease or, or, or a separate commitment to finance another car that's just going to depreciate. Um, So I always uh, stand by the fact that you should always spend as little as possible on depreciating assets and as much as possible on appreciating assets. So if it were me uh, and I was was in that situation, of course, drive the car that you want, but if you've got surplus above and beyond that, go and invest it. Go set up an investment fund, um, go set up a, a savings account where you can start putting money away for another deposit. Even set up an investment for your kids uh, and put money away for them uh, to start saving for them to give them a bit of a nest egg. Um, just try and get that money out of your bank account because otherwise you're going to spend it on uh, on silly things. Mate, I've, I've got a rule of thumb with this stuff. Uh, I think that you your depreciating assets should not assets. be... All right, I'm going to start again. <laughs> I've got a rule of thumb for this stuff. I think your depreciating assets shouldn't be more than 10% of your net worth. So if you're worth a million dollars, then you deserve 100 grand worth of cars, jet skis, push bikes, whatever you want. Whatever you want. Right? If you're worth 100 grand, then it shouldn't be more than 10 grand. And if you're worth 10 grand, then you should have a fair dollar car. It's no good having a net worth of 10 grand and driving around in a $100,000 leased car because the depreciation on that and the running cost of having such an expensive car with a, with such a small uh, asset base in growth assets is really going to stun uh, your ability to get ahead financially for a, for a long time. And it's a rough rule of thumb, uh, but if you, if you stick to it, you, you know, do that for 10 or 20 years, you end up rich. Yeah. Peter Curious has said Ned Kelly uh, financing. That's us, Pete. Ned Kelly, <laughs> Ned financing. Kelly financing. He was a crook, wasn't he? He was, uh, he was a bank should, robber, wasn't you he? You should have seen uh, 
Sam Beard the other week, mate. It was atrocious. <laughs> it's worse than mine. Oh, look, I was very crook. I, no, I hadn't had, I didn't have a shave or I didn't have a, a haircut in four weeks. I was starting to look like Wolverine or something. You're it looking was a, like something. It was know. a mess. It was no good. It's but it's good. it's trimmed up now anyway. All right. All right. So anyone watching, remember, ask your questions. Don't uh, don't be shy. Yeah, uh, this is, a, I guess, a bit of a, a sensitive subject, Sam, this, this question. I think we need to have a bit of a chat about it. Um, particularly for us blokes, I think this is really important. Yeah, this one's, this, this one's going to take us out, I reckon, uh, to 6.30. This we, will take us to 6.30. We'll talk about this all day. All right, I'm breaking the table. So, uh, what is risk management in small business and why is it so important? You could answer this question in a hundred different ways and there'd still be more to talk about. And this this is things, most people just don't consider this stuff, uh, especially in small business. Mm. Do, do you want to wanna start us off, Jackson? Yeah, mate. So we started our conversation about risk management probably about four years ago, right, Sam? Yeah, I remember when we met, when we were working years ago. together and, I go, and, and Sam asked me to, to review his superannuation at the time. <laughs> and I go, all right, Sam, let's do a bit of a review. So I went in and I did the review for him, took him through what, what, he, what he had in super, the insurance that was there. And I go, mate, have you thought anything about risk management? Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> I don't need risk management. I'm, I'm five foot four, four and bulletproof. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he wouldn't, didn't want a bar of it. He goes, I couldn't sleep at night if I had insurance. They go, all right, mate. So I kept whittling away at him. And we got to a point where where your wife, Elise, got pregnant, right? She did. She did. And Sam comes over and he goes, all right, mate, now's time. Right? We, we need to start talking about risk management. My perspective on life has changed. It's not just about me anymore. Uh, I've got a, I'm going to have very soon a small mouth to feed. And uh, I, I can't sleep at night if I don't have the right risk management. That's actually very close to how the conversation I've went. I've a good memory, Sam. <laughs> There's this brains under this top knot, I tell you. <laughs> right? So we went through the whole process with, with Sam and his wife, Elise. We had a good conversation about it, hard conversation. We went through the whole risk management side of things. And particularly given that we've recently started a small business, yeah. uh, we tried to understand exactly what the risks were associated with, with anything happened to either of us. Mm. Uh, I remember we went for a, a dinner uh, with, our, uh, with our partners. Uh, my partner cried, she's a crier. <laughs> Um, and uh, that was that was a bit that was a bit embarrassing. Uh, we didn't cry. We uh, didn't cry. No, we didn't cry. No. Uh, but we ended up talking through the whole risk management side of things, involving our partners in the process, yeah. explaining to them the risks of what we were doing, and getting all of this set up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, mate, I, I uh, obviously I'll, I'll let you take over. What's what's happened, mate? Yeah. So essentially, what's happened over time, Jackson has whittled me down. I had this wog mentality. I said, I'm not getting any insurances. I'm going to get the money and put it under the bed, and I'm going to be all right. So that was a mentality I had for a very long time, all right? Uh, and then Jackson said it, my wife got pregnant. I said, all right, this, it's, it's time, right? We, we're starting the business. We're sort of putting our heads on the chopping block saying, you know, there's, there's essentially a lot of risks that, that we're taking now. Let's uh, minimise them where we can. So we got uh, life insurances, income protection, trauma. There was a few other bits and bobs that... Uh, Jackson and Sal sort of structured for me through superannuation, a little bit personal and, and things like that, my personal name. And then shortly after it happened, what, what do you reckon? Three months, three months. Or, or three months after we had all these insurances uh, got uh, put in place, I started getting a little bit sick, right? I started getting a little bit crook um, and it was it's coming on slightly, uh, bits and bobs at the start. And then one day I had this this uh, this gut wrenching pain, right? I just, I just couldn't bear it, right? And I essentially uh, went home that night, really really sore. Uh, a few hours later, right? I, I, I could not deal with the pain anymore. Uh, turns out I've got this condition called diverticulitis, which is like uh, in your intestines, and it's uh, essentially pits in your intestines, right? It gets painful, all right, sometimes. So over the past uh, sort of eight weeks uh, since my daughter's been born, I've had diverticulitis, you know, three times. It's come back. I've been in and out of hospital a couple of times. Last time I came out of hospital, I, I got a fever uh, and then I, I caught influenza uh, and, then I, um, and then I actually had a reaction to the antibiotics for the influenza and it made me even worse. It made me even worse. I haven't been at work for I don't know how many weeks it's been. It's been a very long time, probably 
three weeks since I've been at work uh, solidly. And before that, I was on and off work for probably for about five weeks. And we had this conversation the other day, uh, you know, about three weeks ago. And we, I said to Jack, I said, I don't know if I can work, mate. Like, I don't know if I can ever come back to work. And he goes, lucky you got that insurance. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And thank God I've, I've actually, uh, uh, I've, I've actually, <laughs> we, yeah. Yeah, we, we memed you in here, didn't we? We sent, you, we sent Sam a bunch of flowers and we said, we hope you die the tick you like these flowers. <laughs> so, uh, we can make light I, of the situation. I can't escape these blokes. No. I can't escape these blokes. So long story short, I will be coming back to work. I took a month leave yeah. uh, to recover. As you can tell, I'm, I'm wired, so I, I'm recovering. <laughs> back. Uh, I'm, I'm back. I'm ready to do work. I haven't had this amount of energy for months. Um, but it could have gone the other way. And if I got sicker, if I was more crook, and I've, I've got the, the business, you know, the, the business has, has got debts, the business has got responsibilities, it's we've got, got investors, staff, we've got to keep we've got investors, we've, we've got, um, we've, you know, we've got targets that we've set ourselves. We've got clients too. We've got clients, you know what I mean? We've got clients that we've got to, we've got to help. Uh, we have business partners. Like there's, there's a lot of responsibility in running the business. I've got, uh, I've got properties. With those properties, I've got mortgages. Um, I've, I've got my wife. She's on maternity leave. I've got my daughter. Uh, she's nine weeks old, so she hasn't started working yet. You've got bludger. But the, the thing is, uh, all these uh, responsibilities that I had, uh, that, I, that I have, if I didn't get better and be able to come back to work, and I was borderline, so I saw it as a reality, how, who was going to pay my mortgage? Who was going to feed my family? And it just cements the fact of how important it is mm. to have risk insurances in place because nine out of 10 people, if something were to happen and they weren't able to make those mortgage repayments or they weren't able to get that income that they produce every month from their job or for their business, everything would fall over. 100%. The whole pyramid would collapse. And it's the frame of mind, right, as, as well too, Sam. It's like not having that, that I guess, the, the conflict of feeling like you have to get back to the office because if yeah. you don't, the wheels don't stop turning. And look, I've seen this a lot. I've seen both sides of the equation. Um, look, it, it just kind of hits it home that I've been able to, to get a positive outcome for Sam. Mm. But I've had people calling me from inside an ambulance that you can hear the ambulance going off of rushing them to hospital, trying to get insurance on the phone on their way to hospital. I go, mate, sorry, like, like it doesn't work that way. Mm. And most people don't see the value of this until something happens either to them or some, to somebody close to them. Uh, and look, I'm sure that you guys have, have heard me talking about it before. Um, my father was a very stubborn man uh, and I tried to convince him for years when I was just getting started in the industry to let me look at his, his risk management strategy, look at his super, help him get ready for retirement. He goes, no, no, it's all sorted. It's all sorted. Um, funnily enough, my father back in the day uh, used to work as a, as a financial advisor back in the 80s. Obviously, industry was very different back then. Um, and he said, I know what you do. I've done it all myself. And I took his word for it. He got diagnosed with stomach cancer. And uh, at the time, he said, oh, okay, Jack, can you look into my, my, my insurance, my risk management strategy? And the stuff that he had in place was so old, it wasn't worth the paper it was written on. Now, he actually never got paid. Uh, and he was in a situation where he was on the opposite end. So it's stuff like this that you really need mm. to be mindful, particularly as a small business owner. So it's twofold. It's having the right risk management strategy about being able to outsource that risk if you can't afford to self-insure, right? Mm -hmm. And if you've got millions and millions and millions of dollars in the bank, then you don't need insurance. But if you can't afford to self-insure, then you need to pay a premium to an insurance company to cover that risk. The other side of things as a business owner, Sam, is having the right infrastructure to support. Mm. Uh, we were only talking the other day, like, what would you have done if you were just a one-man band? I would have been in, I would have been in a bit of grief. Mm. Um, Oh, for certain, some things would have failed if you didn't have the team to support. Yeah, um, yeah it would end up in a little bit of trouble. And it, it just cements the fact that if, if as a business owner, um, maybe you can do everything yourself while you're, while you're well and healthy. But what happens when you want to go on a holiday? Like how many business owners do you know that haven't been on holiday since they started their business 10 mm -hmm. years ago? They've never been overseas uh, since they started their business. Now, I don't know, for... For me, I wouldn't start a business. I could never go on an overseas no. holiday. Well, uh, our friend Alex Manetti here, one of our, our best podcasts that we've done, he said in the first three years of his business, he, he basically had head down, ass up, and yeah. just worked every single day in his business. But then after that point, he set up the right infrastructure 
to allow him to be able to go away on holidays and do the things that he wanted to do. Alex is a very successful business owner. Correct. And it's, it's about that, that framework. Okay. How, how much of our systems and processes paid off through this situation? Heaps of them. It showed that, well, look, we're still here. We're still the still lights here. are on. The, we, you know, the we sticker's still on the wall. The sticker's still <laughs> not. It still says, welcome to Aureus over there. Yeah, that's right there. there welcome is. to Aureus. So even though, um, you know, I was out of action, uh, the show went on. The show went on, and a good business, a good business should be able to operate uh, without its owners being present. Do you know what I mean? So I think all business owners should strive to get to the point where their business can fully function, uh, not only survive, but it could continue to grow uh, without their without their presence. And to me, 100%. that is the sign of, of the ultimate business. Correct. And look, I think for those of you who are business owners who are watching this, your test of your risk management strategy is, of course, make sure you've got the right protection. But do 90-day projects that allow you to set your business up and then actually step out of it for, it might be just for a couple of days to start off with, it might be for a week, a couple of weeks, and then come back and see what's gone wrong, plug those holes, and then try it again. Yep. And your measure of success is what your business does in your absence. Because I think a lot of small business owners particularly adopt this frame of mind that no one does what I do better than me. Um, and by having that mentality, you're proving yourself right inherently. Um, as the old saying goes, he who said he can and he who said he can't are both right. So you got you got to prove yourself right either way. I've got a good story about that. You yeah. want to hear it from Tell today? Me, come on. So today we had um, one of one of my clients um, while I was off. Gary, uh, we were refinancing their home loan, and Gary, uh, the the mortgage broker here in our office, uh, was was he basically picked up the stick after I dropped it, and he was he was running with it, and he was he was doing the deal for them to help them refinance their home loan. Um, get a better interest rate and re release some equity so they can they can build a granny flat. And an email came through. I saw the email and they were asking for something. And I said, yeah, this is this is how you, you do it. And then five minutes later, I get an email from uh, from Gary and from the client saying, mate, it's it's already been sorted. It's, 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 <laughs> you're too late. You're too late. It's already been sorted. And we had a good laugh about it. And I, they they said, oh, you know, you're you're not the top dog anymore. Like you're not the fastest anymore. And I thought, I don't mind that. I don't mind that. If my team, right, if they can all become greater than us, more power the power to them. Do you know what I mean? You don't have to be the the star of your own show. I, I think to be a good business person, you need to want to see everyone else around you succeed. Hundred percent. Yeah. You can't be uh, the the top dog all the time, mate. No, no. So uh, chip off the old shoulder. So the key takeaways from this, um, doesn't matter how old you are, you are not 10 foot tall and bulletproof or in Sam's instance, five foot four and bulletproof. <laughs> um, you, you need to be mindful and consider your plan B. Uh, what happens if the wheels fall off? Do you have cash in the bank as an emergency fund? Do you have the right protection in place? Do you have the right self-insurance? And also making sure that your business is set up to run without you. You do have safety nets in place. But if you do want to take uh, time off, whether it be voluntary or involuntary, that you have uh, th those protections to give you and your family peace of mind, particularly for business owners, sometimes your biggest asset is your business, uh, whether it be just from a cash flow perspective or from a growth perspective. And the last thing you want to do is run it into the ground. Uh, because you haven't thought about these things uh, or you haven't been able to, to I guess, put, keep your ego at the door uh, whilst you've thought about uh, what if. So uh, that's, it's very, very important. Uh, and we can kind of speak for it for, for first-hand experience. Yeah. So hopefully that's of value. Beauty. All right. All right. So we Next one. This will probably be the, the last one. I think this will be the last one. If, anyone, uh, if anyone's got any questions uh, before we get stuck into this last question, uh, speak now or forever hold your peace because it's, it's nearly 6.30. I can see these emails piling up and I, I still need to go home one day. <laughs> um, I'm sure Jackson has to do the same. So we do need to finish at 6.30. All right. uh, Jackson, this one is for you, it looks right. like, mate. So um, the, the question is, uh, what, are the, what will the effects of the Royal Commission have uh, on the industry as a whole? So for those of you who haven't been following, um, the, the Royal Commission has basically been uh, a government initiative that's been kind of simmering for a while. Um, the financial service industry as a whole, um, although it is not a monopoly, it has become, uh, the, the power is in the hands of very few organisations. The big four banks, uh, some of the other big financial institutions, I won't name and shame, uh, have a significant amount of market stake and market share, 
and essentially have, have been operating in the same or similar fashion for decades. Mm. You've got to realise that many of these organisations have been around for over 100 years. Um, and essentially, they've, they've developed this brand, developed a way of doing things that is very, very outdated. And some of the big things that are, I guess, been brought uh, up to, to attention as part of this Royal Commission that has finally come to fruition and something that I believe is long overdue is around clients paying for services that weren't delivered, uh, having a lack of transparency around fees and value that's being provided to the client, and essentially the overall themes are around taking advantage of uh, the, the lack of understanding and education that the average everyday person has. And the banks have preyed on this and made hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars uh, out of these predatory behaviours. So essentially, the, the government and the Royal Commission and, and essentially all of these uh, the, uh, the, the, the legal professionals and experts have been chucking all of these big organisations on the chopping block, uh, trying to, I guess, uncover all of these issues that have been happening and then essentially uh, trying to, to fix and implement policies that make it a better industry that is, is fair and provides people with equal opportunity. So some of the big things that have come off the back of this, uh, I believe that the whole idea of this vertical integration strategy where you have like a big bank like your CBA, NAB, Westpac, ANZ, who you step in the front door of a branch and they can provide you absolutely every service and every single one of those services comes with a product that's manufactured by them, uh, is gonna be dead in the water. Uh, I believe that uh, through the kind of various iterations, and we've already seen it with instructions from the Royal Commission that CBA has to essentially split up all of their businesses into independent businesses, uh, is going to be a catalyst for future change and, and I guess revolution in the industry. Meaning that they're trying to remove the conflicts of interest. Because if you are a CBA of the world, of course it's in your best interest to flog the insurance to, the, to a person that walks in the door uh, to, to get a home loan. Of course it makes sense for, for you to, uh, to sell uh, advice and, and superannuation in their colonial superannuation fund to someone who buys the insurance. And all of this is kind of this self-fulfilling uh, business strategy that is all about the organisation and not about the client. Mm -hmm. So this is what's going to change. There's also going to be a lot more transparency. They're going to try and simplify fees, simplify disclosure, um, but unfortunately, one of the byproducts of all of that is going to be increased compliance, increased paperwork. And a lot of the time, this paperwork does go over clients' heads because most people aren't familiar. They're not dealing with it every single day. Um, because there's so much complexity, there's always still that opportunity or the chance that uh, a professional is going to try and pull the wool over your eyes. And, uh, and try and say, no, don't worry about that. Um, so summarize or, or kind of paraphrase things uh, in a way that may seem great, but may not necessarily be a, the right interpretation of what's actually going on. So my caution to all of you is that through these changes, and they are going to happen, just be cautious. Be mindful who you're getting advice from. Be mindful to read the fine print. I know it's frustrating, I know it's boring, uh, but read the fine print. And if in doubt, call for a second opinion to somebody else who is independent and non-aligned. Um, you've got the opportunity that if you are in doubt through working with a financial professional, that you can call the Financial Ombudsman Service. It's a free service. They're there to represent you and there to make sure that you aren't taken advantage of. Uh, so if you ever are in doubt, you feel like you've got bad advice, uh, you've lost money as a result of poor advice, uh, and someone's just been overall negligent, seek representation and uh, make sure that you, uh, that you, you follow it through. Um, because it's really important that people do stand up. I think most people just have been taken advantage of and they haven't even realised. I welcome the changes, mate. 100%. They're, they're forcing these other institutions to do business the way we're already doing it. 100%. So I welcome it. Let, it. let them come. A lot of them will exit the industry. Uh, good riddance. Goodbye. There's going to be a, max, a mass exodus. Um, this is going to be an opportunity but potentially a threat. Uh, as people exit the industry, uh, it is going to result in the cost uh, of, of these services to increase. Once again, supply and demand, uh, similar to the property market. If there's uh, a lot of demand and not much supply, then prices are going to go up. Um, so just being mindful that, uh, that, that people are aware of this and just continue to, to understand uh, the value of good advice and are willing to pay because it can make a tremendous difference. Um, even this week, we've been working with a client uh, and through one phone call, through a script that we gave them, they were able to negotiate over half a percent off their home loan. 
Um, it's going to save them tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of the life of their home loan, just because of one five minute phone call. Um, so it just goes to show, if you get the right advice, then uh, you, can, uh, you can achieve fantastic outcomes. That's our fee done. There you go. That's, that's the, the fee we've charged them already done without the other hundred things exactly uh, that, right. we're, that we're doing to help them out. So exactly right. that's, that's the future of that's financial it. advice. Well, that's another installment of uh, Ask or Is Anything, our live Q&A. For those of you who are watching this, uh, once we wrap up, if you've got any questions, continue to post them in the comments. We'll get round to them next week and we'll come back to you with an answer as well. And uh, we will be here next week. Are you going to be here next I'm week? I'm going to be here next week, mate. mate. I am. I'm back. I'm back for good. That's good. That's good I'm back you. for good. All right, everyone. Thank you very much. And we'll catch you same place, same time next week. Enjoy your Wednesday night. Catch you later.